Sharon Healy. I'm the president of the Australian Council of State School Organisations. And before we start, I'd just like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting. For me, it's the Wollum Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge that this land was never ceded. So I'd like to introduce Beck to you. So Beck Nugent is the Digital Projects Manager with the Health Promotion and Education Research Team at Telethon Kids Inst Institute, overseeing a number of digital health projects. Beck is currently project managing two flagship projects, the Bright Tomorrow's App Project and the Beacon App Project, which she's going to be discussing with us tonight. Um, Beck's background in digital health project management and research, user experience, design thinking, app design and community engagement has enabled her to collaborate with a number of digital health projects across multiple research areas at Telethon Kids Institute to support the translation of research to the wider community through digital technology. Beck advocates strongly to include the community, especially children and young people, and disadvantaged families to be involved in each project from the outset, which is a wonderful philosophy. So I'm very pleased to welcome Beck Newton to our Term 3 webinar, and I'll hand over to you now, Beck. Thanks very Hello. much. Hello. Thank you so much, Sharon. And, and thank you for the team, uh, Di and Yeoman, that's also online, for giving me this opportunity to speak to you this evening. Uh, I know I think it's a bit uh, later in the evening for you guys. It's only just hit four, uh, five o'clock here in WA. So still the sun's out on our side. Now I am going to just start uh, sharing the screen and hopefully everyone can see that okay. Uh, yep, I've lost camera, but I'm going to assume that everyone can see it okay. Um, as Sharon mentioned, I'm the Digital Projects Manager at Telethon Kids Institute in Perth in WA. And really my role is just a fancy role for saying that I have the opportunity to speak to families and young children to design and develop apps. So that's, it's a pretty cool job to have. And oops. And uh, before I get started, I also want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we are meeting on, wherever you are in Australia. For myself, it's the Wajak Nua. And I also wish to acknowledge and pay my respects to our elders, to the past, present and emerging, and the continuing culture they make to the life of the city and the regions of this country. So a bit of a, a jam-packed agenda tonight. Uh, I'll try and keep to time, but yeah, I'll just flag me down if I talk over time, but I'll make sure there's a couple of um, minutes at the end for any question and answer. But today I'll be going through a little bit of the research that we found with parents and what they've told us around concerns for cyber safety. I'll also talk about children and growing up digital and some of the impact that social media and being online may have, whether positive or negative for children. I'll then, uh, excited to uh, introduce you to the Beacon Cyber Safety app that we developed uh, here in WA. You're more than welcome while you're listening to um, jump online to the, either app stores. It's free to download. And if you look, look up Beacon Cyber Safety app, uh, you'll be able to find it. Then I'll just go through a couple of tips and strategies around cyberbullying, social media, and screen time and techno tantrums. So hopefully you'll be able to have some uh, really great take home messages at the end of this. Okay, so some of the research, recent research that we've done at Telecom Kids Institute, I'm in a department where we actually look up cyberbullying as well as bullying, and we work with a lot of schools and families to really understand the things that are um, concerning parents as well as students and young people. So in a recent study that we, we did and we surveyed parents of primary, primary school age children, we found that uh, only just less than 40% of parents reported feeling only fairly confident followed by only 15% only slightly confident to support their children's safe technology use. Many of the parents that we spoke to, they expressed worries about their own level of knowledge and also their ability to influence their children's behavior when it comes to technology. And we also found that many were overwhelmed by the amount of information about cyber safety and what we call the, the growing digital divide between parents and their children. So understandably, you know, even young people are starting to even, there's always new things coming up with technology. So it's always quite hard to really stay on top of those trends and things that's happening online. Uh, so growing up digital, um, so the children, uh, so children in this day and age have had access to digital technologies since birth and no memory of life before the internet, which is actually a real astonishing thing when you, when you think about it. 
some of the uh, research that we've done, we're finding that students, and uh, I should note that this is sort of pre-COVID, so this is pre the time where children are being uh, schooling from home and online. We're finding around four and a half hours a day of children, so that's children between zero to 18 years in Australia, using screen-based devices. Uh, for teenagers, the screen time is even higher, averaging just under 44 hours per week. And for preteens, so that's around nine years of age, we're finding nearly a third have a personal social media account and around 60% of those are around the age of 12, despite the minimum age recommendations of social media apps being 13. Uh, so just wanted to highlight some uh, impact of uh, specifically social media, but you know we're seeing uh, over young children spending time online in general. Uh, but research by um, a, a group called the Royal Society for Public Health um, in the UK found that Instagram is the most dangerous social media site when it comes to young people's mental health. The survey consisted of about 1,500 students from 14 to 24 year olds, so young people, um, children and young people, and found that the, show, the photo sharing platform had a serious impact on young people's body image and as well as the quality and quantity of the sleep that they got. Uh, it also contributed to uh, bullying, anxiety, depression, and a genuine fear of missing out, or you might have seen that acronym or hashtag FOMO, that's what that stands for, fear of missing out, um, that makes it uh, really difficult for children to dis disconnect from their devices. Um, Snapchat and Facebook were also reported to be similarly damaging, with uh, the only uh, platform at the time, uh, YouTube, being ranked as having an overall positive experience um, so a po overall positive influence on young people's lives. So we're seeing that on the left of that phone there, that's the negative impacts. On the right is the positive. So of the positive impacts, uh, social media has been found to be, has found to support young uh, people's self-expression and their self-identity. So people are able to use fashion, art, music, and conversations to express themselves and show the world what they care about. So digital literacy as well as a, as a positive impact allows young people to build their skills and understand the basics of internet safety, such as setting strong passwords, understanding and using privacy settings, for example, and what to share or not to share online. And lastly, another positive impact that was found was community building and support. So social media and being online provided greater opportunities for connection and growth. Uh, and as, as well as a sense of belonging, which can uh, also help to reduce the risk of mental health issues. So access to digital technology can have uh, enormous educational and social benefits. However, their use by children is not without risk. So children's exposures to these factors places them at risk of adverse physical, social and mental health outcomes. When we look at these challenges, we've grouped them from our research into these five areas and we make sure that the research that we do, and especially the product that we developed, the Beacon Cyber Safety app, looks at these different categories and make sure, makes sure that we're able to address these challenges. So we're seeing uh, a, a challenge of content risks. So that's exposure to harmful or incorrect information, for example. There's contact risks such as grooming or harmful interactive behaviours such as cyberbullying. Privacy risks, which is obviously, uh, you know, posting online and, and losing control of data or their digital footprint, what we call. Um, conduct risks, so how people are behaving online, such as downloading or even uh, trying those new social media trends that could be quite harmful. And also the emergence recently of lifestyle risks. So we're seeing physical health being associated with screen time use. Uh, there's a, um, a description called uh, tech neck. So that's when you're looking down at devices often that's causing issues. And we're also seeing eye strain issues as well and amongst um, more physical health risks as well. So we always try and balance these out with the positives. So we look at the opportunities as well as the challenges. So the rising popularity of technology use, even among young children, can pose considerable risks, but many of those opportunities um, sorry, but new opportunities to many aspects of their development. So when used effectively, technology can promote children's academic, academic achievement through learning and creativity, through digital literacy. So when we use that, which I find it's being often used in, in research, the word digital literacy, it's uh, referring to the skills they need to live, learn and develop 
through digital platforms. Uh, opportunities such as social interactions and skills to build their relationships, make new friends and share experiences online. And then of course, the opportunity of uh, having those broader connections. So being able to connect to people that they wouldn't have otherwise uh, been able to connect to. So the uh, director of the Beacon Cyber Safety App, she also leads the health promotion department within Telethon Kids. She uses a really great analogy here of uh, treating technology like a swimming pool. I'm just going to hit play and hopefully this sound will come through okay for everyone. As parents, it can be really tricky knowing the sorts of things that we can do to support our children when they're using technology. And one thing that we've found is really helpful is to think about technology the same way that we think about a swimming pool. For example, a swimming pool, uh, we give our children swimming lessons, we put fences around them, uh, we give our children opportunities to learn first aid and ways that they can help themselves and help each other in, in that environment. Similarly, when they're using technology, we put fences around it through filters, we uh, provide them with lessons, we sit with them, we monitor what they're doing, we teach them how to use the technology much more effectively. And of course, we also show them the sorts of things that they can be doing to help themselves and help others if they have any difficulties online. So technology is really just like a swimming pool. When we get stuck, think about what we do at a swimming pool and do the same when your children are using technology. So yeah, just a really great analogy when you think of how to tackle that cyber the cyber safety issues with your children. As parents. Okay, so I'd love to introduce you to the, the Beacon app project. Uh, this was a partnership made possible by Bank West. Uh, and in August 2019, Bank West funded a three year project for us to develop the Beacon cyber safety app. Uh, so in September of last year, we were able to launch it Australia-wide, so it's available for free for everyone uh, on the Apple uh, App Store and Google Play Store. So for all the new people that have uh, come through, just um, want to say welcome and feel free to download the Beacon app if you haven't already. I'll go through some of the features of the Beacon app. So one of the first things that we wanted to do is we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We, just thinking about the I guess the, the breadth of how much we needed to address in digital technology, everything from cyber safety to setting the, um, parental controls on screen time to talking about body image, there was a lot that we needed to cover. So one of the first things that we did was we partnered with the, some of the go-to resources in Australia for content, as well as the content that we were producing. So eSafety Commissioner was our first partnership. And if you're not aware of the eSafety Commissioner, uh, Australia is the only country in the world that has a government department, uh, the eSafety Commissioner, whose role is to keep Australian families safe online. So we partnered with them first. And next, you may be uh, familiar with Common Sense Media. I'm just talking to the slide on the left there. And Common Sense Media is America's go-to resource for digital uh, information and cyber safety. They also have a very robust and uh, detailed review process of apps and games and books and movies. So if you're ever wondering, for example, uh, you know, if an app is appropriate for your child, you can actually uh, look up Beacon and we've used the Common Sense Media uh, information to help relay whether that app is appropriate for your child. You can see uh, a ton of other different partners on board and on the right, our dissemination partners, we're now working with uh, schools, so Department of Education, Catholic Education, independent schools. You can see some not-for-profits in there as well, such as the Fathering Project and Project Rocket, which is for young people, and then some of the tech industry involved as well, such as Microsoft and Apple. So a lot of people involved in the project. Now, this is what we call the Beacon Digital Citizenship Framework. We literally spent something like three solid months uh, really understanding how can we possibly fit all of the topics into categories and topics that make it quite easy for parents to understand where to find things. So currently in the Beacon app, these are all the categories and subtopics that we cover in the Beacon, uh, in the Beacon app. I should note the Beacon app is for parents, carers and educators of children zero to 18. So we cover everything, even if you've got little ones, uh, you know, two or three year, years old and looking at screen time advice all the way up into body image and uh, sex and relationship with, with your older teens as well. We have found that while working with young people, they have actually found that Beacon has actually been quite a good resource for them as well. So we're now finding a lot of young people jumping online. But as you can see, we've got everything from your apps and devices, 
uh, talking about the actual apps as well as how to set the parental controls to things such as managing screen time, relationships, all the way up into online safety, like talking about grooming uh, and things like that. So this is just a bit, uh, a little promo that we've created for Beacon and it kind of um, wraps it all up into a, a little advertisement for you. The online world is home to some pretty amazing things, but it grows and changes quickly. So it's easy to feel left in the dark with what your kids are up to. That's why we created Beacon, a cyber safety educational app designed to keep you up to date so you can keep your kids safe online. Beaky here will serve you up current content that's been tailored to your family's needs and give you access to heaps of articles and videos put together by the experts in cyber safety or find the answers to the things you've always wanted to know. To set some boundaries, create a custom online family agreement for things like screen time, device-free zones and gaming. Don't feel left in the dark. Download Beacon today, the switched on app for families online. There you go. And all of uh, these videos are actually downloadable or shareable online as well. So I'll give you our Beacon website at the end if you'd like to share it or uh, ask um, Diane or, or Sharon to help share it for us as well. So I'll actually go the through- The online world oh, is home to- Just trying to skip this slide. There we go, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, so I'd like to take some time to go through how you can actually use Beacon at home. Uh, as I mentioned, it is, it is a free to use app and of the articles that we've got in there that I mentioned, we're over about 600 different articles. We worked very closely with parents to make sure that these articles were written in snippet size articles. So there's about one scroll and you've got all the uh, answers at your fingertips. And they're what we call evidence-based articles. So everything that's in there has been trialed and tested. So you can be um, confident in actually reading some of those strategies that's actually been used in real life. There are four main sections of the, the Beacon app, and I'll go through each of these with you uh, so you have an idea of how you can actually use it. But we've got the For You, which is on one tab, the Browse section, we have a Family section, and the Support Services section. So signing off with the For You page, once you download it, this is a page that you actually land on. And this is uh, literally what, you know, what it's called, It's For You. And what we've uh, created in there at the top there is what we've called, Be uh, sorry, I should mention Beaky is our little mascot. So when it says ask Beaky a question, we're looking at the little mascot. He has been referred to as an orange Mike Wazowski from uh, Monsters Inc. <laughs> but uh, no, he's our Beaky anyway. Um, so you can actually ask Beaky a question. And a lot of the uh, things that parents have told us when we were working together with them is one of the biggest issues is that they don't know what they don't know. So how can they search for things if they actually don't know it exists? So, you know, if there's a the latest app that's out there, but how do I know what it's called to search for it? So we've created the search engine in a way where you can actually ask the question as opposed to just searching for the name of the app. So what's commonly written, for example, on there is what gaming apps are safe for my children? Or, uh, you know, um, there was that example of, is my child ready for social media? Or uh, a number of different questions that you can actually pose the For You page also tailors the information that you actually put in the family section. So one of the things that we recommend is that if you want information that's tailored to the ages of your children, all the devices in your home, all the areas of cyber safety that you're interested in, you just simply go to the family section, which I'll go through in a second, put in your children's details and some of the other things that interest you as well. And every time you go into the Beacon app, that for you page will recommend those uh, articles or videos that we think that we think that you should maybe know. Uh, then, lastly, what we've got as well uh, in this section is we've developed something called push notifications. So we know all know the notifications that you get in your phone. I do highly recommend to turn on the notifications for Beacon. It is our job at Telethon Kids to bring forward the things that we feel parents need to know. Uh, when we first started this project, it was very much soon around the time that we had the, um, the suicide video that was trending in TikTok. You may recall that incident. And we had kind of just launched Beacon and we thought, you know, this is exactly why we've got these notifications. So in the morning, our team were alerted to the fact that this was happening. We were able to quickly write up an article saying, uh, just recommending parents within the article. There is you know, a video that's now circulating. Please keep your children offline today, especially off TikTok. 
uh, if they have seen it, here are some steps that you can follow, such as reporting the video to the platform within TikTok. You can actually report it to the eSafety Commissioner. And also we recommended support services that you and your child may uh, need to speak to in case you actually did see that, that video, which was such a horrendous video. And uh, when we got that within about I think it was within about an hour or two hours, we were able to push that notification out to our users and they saw that and they were, uh, I think about 80% of our users were able, able to tap onto that and read that information. So it's a really valuable tool for us to try and keep parents alerted to these things. If there's nothing to alert parents for, you know, we just simply let them know things that are trending and uh, just to keep an, out, an eye out for certain things. Um, another example we used Beacon for recently was around hearing uh, COVID in the media. And, you know, a little bit prior to that was, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and things like that. So although it's not related directly to cyber safety, it is related to the digital environment, which is where they can easily see information about COVID, for example. So we pushed out a new notification uh, and sent parents a video that was talking about uh, speaking to your children about serious uh, serious harms or events that are on, on in the media. And at the time when we'd sent that out, I remember shortly after I received an email from a dad who, who had received it. And he had basically said, um, thank you for sending it out because I didn't actually think about the impact of my child seeing these things online. And he went to go check on his daughter. And here in Perth, when we went into lockdown, for example, that was the week that children were returning back to school. So he found his uh, daughter like crying on the bed because she just saw that I can't go to school anymore and she didn't realize why. So this video was able to give him some tips on how to talk to her about those sorts of issues. So um, just a couple of examples of how we use the push, push notifications. In the browse section, this is where you can see all of those topics. Uh, you've got, you know, your two types of people. You're either one, you don't have time to look for the information and you prefer Beacon to send this information to you. So you can be one of those users and just stay around the For You page. But we also have parents that actually like to go through and explore everything. So uh, in the browse section, that's where you can go to look through those different categories and the different uh, topics under there. We've got two features in browse. Uh, you can see at the top there, one's called Hot Topics. So if you'd like to just see what's trending on at the moment, we'll put a series of different uh, videos and articles in the hot, top, hot topics for you. And these are directly informed by our cyber educators around Australia that are partnered with us, as well as the parents that we have an online reference group. And they often come forward to say, uh, you know, hey, Beck, something's happening in Victoria at the moment. Um, for example, I heard that there was like a vaping trend that was happening. So we need some information about talking to children about online challenges and, and why they're, they're getting into these sorts of things. So that will actually uh, update quite regularly. And then we've got the saved underneath there, which is uh, simply being able to save an article and refer back to it when you, when you like. Then we've got the family section in here. Uh, I mentioned this uh, earlier. This is where you can actually go to tailor the content in the For You. So we simply just ask for a name or nickname of your child and the month and the year of birth. So those two, uh, sorry, the, the month and the year of birth is able to then have uh, Beacon start tailoring the information based on your child's age. What we've also developed in here, and this is strongly recommended by a lot of cyber educators as well as us as well, is to create a digital family technology agreement with your children. So this is literally an agreement. Uh, it's, a, it's a tailored one, so you can go in there and you can customize it as you please. But it's really a great place to start for setting boundaries, rules, and speaking about consequences about the family agreement. So we've actually uh, separated out into different sections. So in case you sort of don't know where to start, we've got a number of different options that you can follow, and you can just highlight the ones that you want to include in the family agreement. So time limits is obviously around how many hours a day they can use it or what time devices need to be switched off, for example. Safety is around your little one saying, oh, mom, I saw something really bad online. Um, you know, I'll promise to tell an adult if I see something that's uncomfortable. Or even things like I will, I will ask for permission if I want to take a photo of a friend or post it. Then we go into device use. So where you can use the device, where it could be, where it has to be uh, charged at the end of the night. And then going into specific behaviors around gaming and apps, social networking. When we tested this with families, 
uh, parents loved it. They were able to have some guidance on how they set those boundaries. But what was really great that came out of it is that when we asked the kids, like, what do you think about this? You know, of course, they were like, well, we don't like setting all these rules. However, if we have to set all these rules, what about mum and dad? Can't we ask them to do stuff as well? And I thought that was just, it was brilliant because it really empowered children to actually manage their time, but also empowered them to say, well, mum and dad shouldn't be using the devices as, you know, 10 hours a day or whatever, you know, whatever um, exaggerated hour they think mum and dad are on the device for. So this is really a family agreement. So having, uh, having allow your children to have the options to also um, come up with some agreements with the parents. And so that's why we, we added the add your own section in there. And as you follow those steps, right at the very end of it, you can actually sign. Uh, so the, your child signs with their finger, mum and dad signs with their finger, and it actually exports into a, a PDF. So if you've got a printer, you can actually print it out and have it at home, or you can save it. And we tell parents to uh, often refer to this if you're trying to, uh, you know, repeat those sort of guidelines. So trying to get ch children off devices. Hey, don't forget, we've, we've signed it. This was the consequence that we agreed with. Uh, you know, this is something that we do. So we highly recommend uh, starting with a family agreement. Uh, another thing that I've heard when I've spoken to parents is, oh, you know, my child's 16, we're way past that. There's, there's no chance that we're going to be able to, you know, do that sort of agreement. But, you know, it doesn't have to be a formal agreement. I mean, if you don't want to use that to create the actual printout, you don't have to. But, for example, my partner and I, uh, we don't have children, but we created an informal agreement um, the other day because we just realised that when we sit and watch TV at night, I'm often on my laptop and then I've got my phone in front of me. So that's three screens in front of me. And we just made it a hard rule. You know, if we've got the TV on and we're watching together, no more devices in, on our laps. Um, and, you know, that's a that's an informal agreement that we both agreed to. So there's no reason why you can just have that um, sort of informal agreement with, you know, an older teen if you're having issues with that. In this section, we also have a couple of advice around having the right conversations as well as setting parental controls. And I can go through that in the next couple of slides. And the last section here really came about by uh, our cyber educators specifically. So they're the educators that go into schools and speak to you know, the students and families. Uh, one particular um, cyber educator called YSAFE, you might have heard of them, they're around Australia. Uh, they're one of our partners and they said to me um, when we're testing the app to say, oh, you really need to have a section that's, uh, you know, a, a one button away from getting that support services because often parents are coming to us with crisis. So, you know, they've listened to the chat right at the end, oh, you know, my, my daughter's just gone through cyber bullying or, you know, something to do with, a, uh, you know, a, something they've posted that they can't get back. So this is really the area for those crisis moments, but also just so you're aware that there is steps that you can take to try and deal with some of those big issues. So these steps that you can see in the support section, we work together with the eSafety Commissioner, as well as uh, Think You Know, which is the Australian Federal Police. And these are the actual reporting steps that is recommended by both of them. So you're able to report cyberbullying, grooming and image-based abuse, or any illegal and inappropriate content. And uh, similarly, when I was uh, testing with young people, um, I initially just asked them, you know, is the Beacon app the sorts of things that you think mum and dad need to know about when it comes to, you know, being online? And when we got up to the support section, they uh, often they had uh, heard about who the eSafety Commissioner was. They didn't actually know that there was someone else that you can actually report it to. And I found that if they were going through any sort of serious situations, they often wouldn't go to the police because that's just a really big daunting thing for a young person to do. But having someone such as the e-safety commissioner and someone that you can report online without not having to actually be face to face or even pick up a phone call was also a really great way for them to reach out for support as well. And uh, just below that is also uh, a number of different support services that we recommend. So if you're going through any of those uh, crisis moments where you need that extra bit of help, you can actually go through and speak to some of those support services. Uh, so this is just a quick video about one of the dads that uh, he's from the Fathering Project. and He's got some words to say about his use with the, the Beacon app. I've got two kids, Emily, who's 13, and Lucas, who's 11. Emily mainly just uses her MacBook for school. My son, Lucas, on the other hand, he, he loves using any device he can get his hands on. Um, on my Xbox, I probably do like two hours to three hours a day, and on the weekends, probably three to four. On my phone, 
Um, I probably go on it once a day maximum. As kids are growing older, they're using new apps all the time. They hear about different apps as they grow older from their friends or new apps that have been released. And as a parent, you just can't keep up with that. So by having an app like Beacon, you can just have a quick browse on the app and, and go do some research. And then you, you can keep up to date really easily with what they're, what they're doing and what's involved. What I really like about it is just the general broad range of topics that are available. A lot of it is not so much about looking for an answer to a question, but having all that information at your fingertips. One of the features I like about it is the family agreement. So that allows us to periodically go and have these conversations with each child and go through a number of different elements around. I've got two kids, oh, Emily sorry. who's 13 and Luke but having all that information at your fingertips. One of the features I like about it is the family agreement. So that allows us to periodically go and have these conversations with each child and go through a number of different elements around um, cyber safety. So that reminds us of all the different categories of, of information that we need to talk about and the different issues we need to talk about to make sure they're all covered to actually have the conversation from an informed perspective. I think my kids were more appreciative that well dad's actually taken the time to um, understand what we're doing and, and he cares about us. Sorry about that. I was just trying to I was, I was about to try and move this out the way. <laughs> Alright, so here's just a couple of examples of uh, the a lot of things that parents are searching for in the app. So we've got uh, something called Techno Tantrum, which I'll talk about in a second. And that's really just trying to get children offline. Then we've got cyberbullying. Uh, we've also got gaming, which is a hot topic as well. And so giving advice and strategies around uh, gaming and gaming addiction and how to uh, create a, a safe gaming environment. And so I'll just spend uh, this uh, part going through some of the main topics that parents are actually asking advice for. I should note that the information that I'm providing here are all articles and have taken um, have been taken from articles out of Beacon. So looking at cyberbullying, some of the things that we uh, recommend uh, looking at is signs and symptoms. So how do you know if your child is being cyberbullied? Uh, so things such as changes in personality. Uh, you're seeing your child becoming secretive about their online activities, changes in device use. So sometimes we're seeing a change where children are constantly checking their device because they're seeing, you know, if they are being cyberbullied, they're constantly looking at those messages or uh, conversely, they're not looking at it at all. So any sort of extreme changes in how they use their device. Uh, unexpected changes in friendship groups changes in their sleep patterns, for example. And even if uh, the cyberbullying is happening online, we are finding that often it is from students within the school as well. So you might find uh, a change in how they are at school. So a decline in the schoolwork or even an avoidance of school or, or not being happy going to school. Um, so if you feel that your uh, child is being cyberbullied, um, a couple of uh, strategies and tips around here. So we're finding that children um, don't want to tell their parents because they fear the response, sorry, they fear your response of actually blocking and banning their device. It's the most common thing that we always hear around um, seeking help is that they're just afraid of the repercussions of telling uh, you as a parent. So one of the things that we need to do is talk early and talk often uh, about communication. We need to create a safe space where children won't be afraid uh, to, to talk to you about the issues and knowing that you know they won't have their app um, taken off them or their device use banned. And so one of the things um, I say uh, in regards to an example of what you can say is, uh, for example, uh, you know, I know that you love Snapchat, but uh, I just need to know if anyone is being mean or is posting bad things about you or to you, please come and tell me. I won't take Snapchat or your phone away from you and we will work through together on how to fix this. So really just letting your child know that and, you know, you can say this at any time, even now, you know, after you get off this call to just let them know that you're there if they need help and that, you know, you, you are obviously willing to follow through with that as well, that you won't actually take away their device use because that often doesn't help um, and will actually shut them out from telling you these things. Uh, and that, that particular uh, tip is the number one tip recommended by one of our um, school psychologists, cyber educators. And if your child is going through um, an incident of cyberbullying, um, so there are ways that you can actually support your child. 
So one is to um, empower your child and build their confidence. So you can do this. Um, you can do this by working together with them to help them make the decision decisions for themselves, rather than telling them what they need to do. So if you feel that you're struggling, um, if you feel that your child is struggling to open up to you, another thing we recommend is ensure that you know that they have a trusted adult that they can turn to. So if it's not you, it could be, say, a school teacher or it could be an auntie or an older cousin or someone that's responsible that you feel uh, you could check in and make sure that they could check in with them as well. Uh, then also um, encourage positive connections and coping strategies. So what we mean by this is try to keep your child engaged with interests such as sports or dance or anything that connects them with other young people outside of school. Uh, you can also uh, do activities with extended family, for example, and doing these sorts of things reminds your child that they are loved and they, they're lovable as well, which is very important. Um, and also help your child to identify different resources they can use to work through the situation. So, you know, they can speak to their school psychologist, um, again, that trusted adult, um, or even reaching out to uh, a counsellor online. Two other things you can do is contact the school. So often schools will have a policy in place to address cyberbullying, so they'll have steps that they can carry out. And you can ask for that support even regardless of whether or not the bullying is actually occurring um, from a student at your school. They will still have very helpful steps in, in helping out with that. And then with your child's agreement, uh, then talk to the teacher or the school counselor, counselor about the situation. And lastly, if your child is being cyberbullied, um, make sure to protect your child. So if your child is being threatened or if your child themselves are indicating signs of self-harm, for example, which we know is quite a big emergence that's happening at the moment, um, please uh, look at getting professional help to, to try and help out with this um, through a counsellor or a support, a support service. And uh, just to reiterate, you can find those services in the support section of the Beacon app. Okay, another question that we often get, and uh, we've, we've mentioned this a couple of times now, is uh, whether your child is ready for social media. So uh, I'd love to, you to ask yourself, even if they're already on social media, these are some really good things to, um, to ask uh, if your child knows about things like this. So is your child able to deal with negative online experiences, including where or who to go for help? And I think you need to ask yourself, are you, are you equipped to be able to help them? So if they say to you, oh, something's happened on TikTok or something's happened on chat, Snapchat, mum, can you show me how to report or block this person? Do you know how to help them through that? And so I always recommend that before allowing your child to be online or if they are online on a particular app, that you yourself should have that app. So just so you're aware of how the app actually works, but there are settings on each of the apps. Some apps have uh, parental control settings, which is great, but we know that they're not completely foolproof. So it's a good idea just to go through each of the settings and make sure that you understand what each of the settings do. Um, so just so you know for yourself, but also if your child is uh, comes to you to ask for that help. Then does your child understand the importance of protecting their personal information? So not only just giving out phone numbers or giving out addresses, but a lot of things that I'm seeing in primary school children and even secondary school children is I'm seeing them, for example, post with their school uniform. And even with my parent, uh, my parents, my friends now who are parents, when it comes to first day of school, the amount of... Uh, posts that I see with them posting, yay, it's so-and-so's first day of school, which is fine if their account is on private, but if it's on public, which a lot of the cases I actually went that, for, I went, you know, one step ahead to see if it was public, I would then actually message them and go, hey, do you know that you're, you know, you've got a picture of your child who one probably doesn't know that you're posting about them because they're so little, um, but you've also got your, the, your child's uniform on there. And that's a way that people, you know, if there were, you know, God forbid predators or anything like that, there's a way that they can actually follow and then know what area that you're in. So just making sure that you yourself understand that, but also your child understanding the importance of that. Uh, then does your child understand how privacy settings for social media work? So again, as I mentioned before, to go through each of those settings um, so that you're aware of how they actually work. Um, does, your under, does your child understand what is safe to share online? So another thing that children are often doing is uh, tagging um, or checking in rather. So checking in where they are. So, you know, they might be at a party or they just might be at the cinemas and they will actually post and then tag that they're at the cinemas. So just being quite mindful of, you know, the repercussions of actually advertising where you are if, you, if your account's on public. 
Then is your child willing to let you establish clear rules? So if your child is on social media, some of the things that we recommend is, uh, as I mentioned before, is for you yourself to have the social media, uh, just so you're aware of how it works. But uh, having your child agree that they will do things such as giving you their username and password, um, checking in on them often so you're aware of the things that they're posting, uh, allowing them to allowing them to agree to friend them. A lot of children don't like that, but you know there's some clear rules that you'd like to put in place. If they don't want to friend them, then another uh, another thing I could suggest is simply just to say, well, I'll check in on your device twice a week, so hand over your device so I can actually have a look at what you're posting, for example. And another uh, one of the tips that I find helpful around is avoiding what we call the techno tantrum. So this is screen time and how to deal with uh, getting kids off, off devices, which is um, a huge one at the moment. So a couple of tips that I like to give. One very important one to start off with is to set a limit before your kids start playing. Um, so this, in doing this, we actually build an expectation in their mind. Often parents kind of forget that it's like, yep, you can start playing, but you don't actually say for how long. And then all of a sudden it's two hours. And so you come and say, all right, well, it's been two hours, let's get off. But children haven't been told that at the start. So it's kind of being able to set that um, expectation up front and center. Uh, next, what I find if you have little ones, uh, I find using sound and visual aids to tell the time. So if you've got a little one and you say half an hour, which is 30 minutes, sometimes they have no concept of, you know, what that actually looks like. So having a clock that actually, you know, um, say, you know, once that hits the 12 or, or anything that visually can tell them, so then they can keep checking in on that clock and having that in front of them. So they're aware that their time is uh, up soon. Uh, obviously give lots of warning before time runs out. And also let them stop at natural break points. So for any parents that uh, have gamers, for example, they're going to say, no, I can't stop right now because I'm right in the middle of ending this mission. And, you know, I can't just stop because then I'll blow it for everyone else that's online or, or whatever it is that's happening. So this is one of the things that you can have a conversation at the start uh, if um, with your child to say, all right, well, how long is that mission going to go for and negotiate that? So if you've only got one hour of screen time and he's saying that this mission is going to go for three hours, then of course don't let them start that mission. So just being aware of those sorts of things that's happening within their game. Uh, this one's another one, um, have another activity scheduled. So what actually happens is that when children are online and especially if they're playing games, for example, uh, they've got all that adrenaline and things going on and um, within their game. So when you get them off the device straight away, they still have all that energy from, from playing that game. And so it's always good to have another activity to go on to straight after. So for example, it could be something as simple as, you know, setting the table for dinner, or it could be, you know, it's time to go walk the dogs or, you know, um, you know, kick a footy around the backyard or something. So having that transition activity to get them off one, one device, but also being able to exert that energy into the, the next device is very helpful too. Uh, and then uh, to, to cover all of that, um, we recommend also to create that Beacon Family Agreement just so you can set those boundaries, rules and consequences. Uh, consequences is a, um, oops, uh, it's just a big one that we, we try and tell parents to just match the consequence to, uh, you know, what's actually been broken. And one of the things that we recommend is to think about potentially not taking away the device as a consequence. Uh, Children, uh, you know, this is we're in this um, sort of generation where this is really the lifeline for children, and often they'll tell you things like that as well. This is how they actually stay connected to people. Uh, so taking them away can sometimes have um, some detrimental consequences. Um, so make sure that you know the consequence fits, um, you know, the rule that you've that you've established in place. So it could just be something else as doing chores or something like that, or even asking your child you know, what is it that you think is a reasonable consequence and then see if you can agree that way. Um, so in, involving your um, children and teens early and often you know, is another tip that we give. Uh, parents often come to say to us they do struggle with trying to start that conversation. So one of the things that you can do in the Beacon app is search for conversation starters. These are all highlighted by that uh, the pink background in the bubble so you can actually see them. But what we've done is we've taken out some really important conversation starters uh, and grouped them by age. So everything from sex and pornography to talking about difficult sub subjects or violence in the media, for example. And these are grouped by, for example, under sevens, uh, seven to thirteens, and then into teens. 
So we recommend having a look through those and it actually gives you some prompting questions uh, that you can actually start with your team. And then also some tips around actually having the right conversations when you're ready. So really uh, being able to plan when to have those conversations so you can work out what you want to say and how you want to say it. Uh, we recommend going somewhere private where you won't be interrupted by a phone call or the TV or having to do something. Um, a really good uh, example is driving in a car. It's somewhere we can start the conversation. Uh, make sure that you are listening and don't judge on what they bring to you. Uh, ask the questions and then ensure that you can together work, uh, work together to get the help that you need. Uh, as I mentioned, if the subject is a little bit too difficult or you need that extra bit of help to try and, uh, you know, find a solution together, then uh, head to the support section uh, to speak to the counsellor or support service. Uh, I recommend there's an amazing group and actually I think they're in Sydney and Melbourne so um, people on the east coast if that's where you're dialing in from uh, that's where they're based and these guys are phenomenal they're called Project Rocket and they're um, Australia's youth movement against um, cyberbullying but actually they talk about a whole range of topics and we've partnered with them to uh, to pick some of the more digital uh, topics to put into the Beacon app, but they actually have uh, an online YouTube channel as well. And they talk about everything. And this is by young people for young people. So even if uh, you are having some trouble with those conversation starters, there's some really great videos that you can actually get your children onto. Um, the videos that are addressed from sort of seven onwards, and uh, you can have a look at all the different topics that they have on there. Uh, I do have, I am just checking time. I do have an example of a video to show you what I mean. And this is just talking about children reaching out for support with parents, uh, sorry, to an adult. Speak to an adult is advice we've heard a million times before, but it's not always that simple. And we work with heaps of young people who tell us they don't feel comfortable speaking to an adult because they're worried they won't understand, they'll overreact, or they'll get them in trouble for the thing that they're seeking help for. But when I was at school, I felt like if I told the person that I trusted, like mum, she would then rock up to school with like a megaphone and like shout it out to everyone, let them all know. I remember that too. Guys, we get it. Using adults as allies can be really helpful, but how do we make sure we get the support we're actually looking for? Well, we asked some of our team members, as well as the young people we work with, how they've used adults in their lives as allies. And well, this is their advice. So when I'm seeking help, I try to go to someone who I'm super comfortable with and someone who obviously won't judge me for what I'm about to say. I will always go to someone that I already have that connection with and who has supported me in the past, who I know will support me through anything that I bring to the table. First and foremost, I have to pick someone that I trust, someone that regardless of the situation, they're going to listen to me, they're going to be honest with me and they're not going to judge. Um, for me, when it comes to adults, I feel like trust is kind of a subjective term. So what I do is I like adults that I have vibe with. If we have the same energy, we're on the same wavelength and we have really good connecting energy, then I'll be able to confide in you. The way I've approached an adult in my life for help in the past is by being brutally honest with them, sat them down and told them I've got this problem and I need your help. I love a good phone call or FaceTime session just because it means it's in real time and I can get the help that I need instantly. When I last asked an adult for help, I was able to just approach them and they were able to make a time for me and we were able to sit down and just talk about it. How I approach adults is through social media. I'll contact them or through emails or text message and I'll just be like, hey, and I'll talk about what's happening and eventually if I'm comfortable, we can talk in person about it. I want to approach someone again by how much I've known them for and it's really easy because that way they know how to help me and what's been going on for me and also they could just tell if I really need to talk about something. The best way to support young people in my opinion is just listen. Often people want to just talk and give their opinion but sometimes people just want to let it out. They don't necessarily need specific advice, they just need someone to just listen and be that place of solace for them. Definitely try to keep an open mind and try your best not to judge. If you took away that judgment and the stigma about any topic, that young person could feel safe and happy to talk about anything to that adult and have an open conversation. I would tell them to seek to understand. Seek to understand our beliefs, our circumstances, our behaviours, because there's always a reason why we do things. So whether you're looking for support, advice, or just someone to listen to, the right adult is out there. You've just got to find them. 
And if you feel like you can't find them, we've linked some sites below that might be able to help you find the support that you're looking for. Yeah, and as we always say, if you don't find the help you need the first time, just keep looking. It is out there. Yeah, and you deserve it. So, peace out, Peer Office. So that's just an example of one of the videos. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, they're, they're, oops, uh, they're phenomenal. They cover everything from body image to using uh, technology to seek help and counselling and wellness, for example. So highly recommend uh, the, that sort of YouTube channel and searching it in the Beacon app. And just a couple of uh, top tips for cyber safety before I wrap up. I know I've gone through a lot of different tips, um, but if there's a couple of things that you wanna take away specifically around today is have a look at role modeling to promote balance and limit. So before you have that discussion with your children about their screen time use, reflect and have a look at what your screen time use is. Uh, a really great tip that um, I learned through speaking with a lot of parents and young children is that uh, I once asked a young person, what do you think mum and dad are doing on their device? And they're like, they're always on Facebook. It must be 10 hours of Facebook a day, which is obviously very exaggerated and very incorrect. And so uh, a really um, a great tip that I can have is if you need to use your device in front of your young child, just um, be openly honest and let them know what you're actually doing so they don't just think that you're on social media. So if you're paying the bills because, hey, I'm paying the bills that's giving you Netflix at the moment, or I just need to look at news or I need to be on emails for work, then let them know that. Uh, two is having the right conversations and starting them early. Three is to set parental controls on devices, on any consoles they have, and even on specific apps. A really great place to start on a, a high level uh, parental control setting is on those Apple iPhones or iPads. If you go into the settings under screen time, uh, that allows you to set uh, screen times on how much time they're spending on their devices and actually locks them out of certain apps as well. Uh, and not a lot of those restrictions in place. So those two articles can actually set you through how to set them up. Um, or you can actually search for specific apps plus the word parental control. So uh, Snapchat parental control, for example. Uh, and then lastly, set up that Beacon Family Agreement that allows you to set those boundaries, rules and consequences in place. And one of the number one rules that we always recommend for parents is absolutely no devices in the bedroom, always out in communal areas. And uh, just want to say thank you. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd love for you guys to download the app. We're always after the feedback. So if there is anything that's missing that you'd like to get in contact with us, please do. Uh, and we also have a range of resources online on the website, as I mentioned, those videos that you saw. If you'd like to share it on Facebook, for example, please do. Um, but I think, yeah, that's, that's my time. Um, I should just add in very quickly that there is a little uh, video around the Bright Tomorrows app, which is a parent, um, child development app that we've also built for children zero to five. So I didn't want to play in case it wasn't relevant for the whole group, but I, I might just hand it back over to Sharon um, just to take any questions for the last couple of minutes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Beck. That was just fascinating. So much information, really helpful stuff. That um, app is in my children are all grown up, so it's probably not relevant until I get some grandkids, which is not <laughs> anytime soon um, but such great information to have and it would have been really handy to have had 10 years ago even so thank you for that uh, were there any questions if anybody um, has questions they can pop them in the chat box or pop a hand up and hopefully we can see you I'm just Often I try and cover as much as I can so there's no questions at the end. <laughs> All right, well, I can't see anything popping up in chat, but if you do have questions for Beck and you want it to come back later, you can always send them through to the EXO office and we can um, email them through and we can get on to Beck and come back to you with a response. But that was fabulous. Um, there were so many things in there that I think are, are really great. I love the fact that the kids, when they were setting up the agreements, want to keep the adults mm. accountable too I think that's yep. very smart of them well done indeed because we do yep. all have it <laughs> be on our devices more than we ought to yep. um and I think the reporting made easy is something that's really vital to have because uh lots of parents would not have a clue how to go about doing that or what is a reportable offense so it seems that you've really got this um everything that parents could possibly need to know they can find on the app so well done thank you very okay. very much and um there are no questions, we might leave it there. So thanks to everybody for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it.
Thank you for thank having you. me. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Have a good evening.